Hello and welcome to this webinar on the fundamentals of futsal team tactics out of possession systems. Uh, this is the final webinar in a short out of possession series that we've done. So if you haven't seen the webinars on individual techniques and tactics and paired and small group te uh, techniques and tactics linked to out of possession, then do look out for these um, as they make up the rest of the series. There's also an in possession series which follows the same pattern of three webinars. And there's a one-off webinar on transition, both the positive and negative transition. So again, if you find this interesting and useful today, then do go and look for those. If you've seen any of those webinars, you'll know us three by now. Uh, my name's Ian Parks. I'm an FA Youth Coach Developer with an additional responsibility to support futsal in the professional club academies. And with me today, I've got England futsal head coach, Mike Skubala, and Graham Carrick, another YCD. Hello again. How are we? How are we doing? How are we doing? Yeah, good to see you. So today, looking at team tactics and out of possession, the plan is to look at three ways that we could defend as a team. We've got the high press, the mid block and the low block. Uh, we'll look at the basics of each of these, look at some of the formations or systems that you might use to defend in these ways. So looking at these numbers here, just to try and add some clarity from the start, the first numbers are the higher end of the court back to the one in goal. So for example, a two, one, one, one would be two strikers, one behind them, one defender and the goalkeeper. So we'll look briefly at why you might use each of these ways to defend and try to tie in some of the content which we've discussed in the individual and small group out of possession webinars. Finally, we'll try and make the links back to football for those watching from a football perspective um, who might be looking to get some transferable returns from a tactical point of view. If we start with this pyramid, which we've shown on all the webinars, uh, we can see we're looking at team tactics. So the third tier up, um, one that starts to feature more often in an international setting. So it's great we've got you Scoobs here with us to talk through what it looks like with the England team. Uh, linked to this, we've got some training footage to look at today in addition to matches, so hopefully this will give us an idea of how it might look when preparing for games. Um, Scoobs, I don't know if there's anything here you want to add before you start to share some of the principles around the DNA. Um, no, I think we've sort of covered this in a few previous uh, modules, if yeah. you like, um, so yeah. I think it's, it's no different really, and it, hopefully we can get into the, even though we're touching in the systems, hopefully we can gain a little bit of a talk around the, the importance of the roles of two players and individuals within it. Brilliant. So this is from the England Futsal DNA, which we've seen again throughout these webinars. Do you want to share your thoughts around what this slide's about? Yeah, so this is really where we set up um, with what we call our defensive lines. So when we're talking to players, we might say we want the team to set up on line one, which is the highest line, the high press line, line two, line three, the halfway line, line four, line five. So this is just really a court reference about how high we're going how high we're pressing or how high we're starting. So, you know, other countries use four lines and, and don't really have the middle line, but but we put in the middle line or halfway line as line three. And then the ultimate line that people forget is the goalkeeper line, obviously. So that's really important when you're pressing. So, you know, generally the, the fifth line is a 10-metre line um, used a lot on sort of power play structures, uh, 12 metres halfway. So, yeah. And then... Within that, what we try and do, we call it defensive lines and then lines of defence. What we try and do is make sure that we have three lines of defence always for our cover and balance, which we'll probably get on to a little bit more detail later. Okay. Is there, is there, any, is, is there ever a time that, um, see the first line there, line one, um, is there ever a time that you'd go even higher than that to really attach to players? Have you got like a really special player or something like that or just... Uh, line, yeah, line one's really high to be fair. That's like 30 meters, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, would we go any higher? Um, you could if you were doing something special called deny, so a bit like a basketball top um tactic. So there's a there's a really good player called Rubinho that plays for Russia, um, and they try and get him on the ball individually. So you might actually send someone really, really high. It doesn't happen very often, yeah. Um, but you could have situations, I would say that's dipping into more the strategy. You know, rather than the, the systems, were they moving into the strategy element? Yeah, cool. yeah, good question. Because is that the idea as well, similar to football, that you would drop off a little bit to let them have it and then go and press rather than stand next to them? Is that the same sort of idea? 
Yeah, so we, we, when we're pressing, we want them to, you know, set the trap, if you like. So we call yeah. it about setting the trap. So we want them to roll short, but we need to be in that position where we can go and get good pressure on the ball. And we might, we have a rule of thumb around pressing the second pass. So, you know, let them have the first one, go and put slower pressure on. And then on the second pass, we really start to go really aggressive. So again, that's, we're talking about the tactics. What I've dipped into again there is the strategy of how you do the tactics um, and close in the middle. So there's lots of nuances within that that world-class teams do to to get the ball back quickly. Okay. And this slide here? Yeah, so this probably is, uh, I think we've talked about this in defending before. This is about, you know, we, yeah. we half the court. Um, but if you see on the axis, you know, we'll probably look at this in a, in a more of a 2-1-1, one, one, how, we, how we really clear about pushing the ball into areas, if you like, that we want to go and win it. And then how do we take advantage? And, well, just making the court half the size, you know, to try and win the ball back so it's harder for teams to play in. These are more of our um, pops, if you like, possession principles. So the things that we, we were trying to do. So with the, you know, can we press the ball? We always want pressure on the ball. Can we counter-press to start? Um, again, they're setting traps on passing lines. Um, do we exchange or not exchange on the first line with players? So these are the little nuances and the principles of play that we try and build within that bigger picture. Um, always around and not through. You'll hear it a lot in futsal. They they use the term close the middle, close the middle. Um, we use the line as a, a third defender, if you like, or another defender, should I say? Um, I don't like I don't like to change between the third and fourth player um, or the lines later on so I don't mind exchanging higher but if you get it wrong so just this is more around our England DNA principles that we put in within the tactical system okay and where would uh, playing with a zone or a man-to-man -man fit into this I know we talked uh, in the last one about whether we follow and you mentioned exchanging then and not exchanging where does that fit with this yeah well I think within the systems we're talking about you can do as you can do them all as a zone you can do them all as a man for man or you can do them all I call a man for man with exchanges so I think there's there's three sort of ways of, of playing a system, if you like, that I say. So you can have a high press in a zone. You can have a high press man for man and following, or you can have a high press, which is man for man, but at certain places exchanging. Um, so th that's where, you know, we might high press against the team and completely follow because physically we're stronger. We might high press against the team and we're just completely taking up the zones because they've got a really strong pivot maybe, or we might high press an exchange on the first line, but not on the second or third line, if that makes sense. So that's the sort of um, underpinning of the system, if you like, and probably the coach's choice. Okay. So you talked about pressing there a little bit. If we go to this one as the first way that a team might defend, do you want to talk us through when you might choose to use this, why you might choose to use this? Yeah, well, again, you know, we might choose the high press because it's, you know, it's aggressive. It gets us high up court. Um, we think that they probably don't have so much of a strong pivot on or a team likes to play out, you know, against all those different, um, I don't know, nuances really. Or or we want to be really aggressive to win the ball high. We don't want them to get settled. Um, all the different reasons why you would high press. Um, but we're, we're trying to, within the high press, we're trying to provide constant cover on the second line. So this is where the lines of defence comes really important because we're saying if we're going really aggressive on the first line, the second line becomes really important for that cover and balance. And where can we where can we create matched up numbers within the presser that we're doing? And then within that park, so you've got all your individual details. So are we pressing strong foot? Are we pressing to close the middle? Are we opening up the middle to close the line? Are we just being really aggressive and running? Um, and I think that's what's really key for me is if you flip it and go to our possession, you know, you would look at how many players are they sending on their first line to, to, to decide how to play out, if that makes sense. Okay. So I was going to say, would, would which one of these you choose depend on how they set up? Just looking at that picture there. Uh, they... It depends. Yeah, it depends. You might want to match it. So I know I see a lot of youth futsal where they defend uh, like a box. Um, I wouldn't use a box, a 2-2, because there's only two defensive lines. Um, but I would match a box if they play in a box, if that makes sense. So, yeah. um, But when I'm high pressing, generally, we'll play a two versus three, um, and we have strategies to take um, press passing lines, so it actually becomes a 2v2. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, I think we'll see some of that in the footage. Yeah. Hopefully. 
Car, anything from, from you before we look at that footage? Yeah, I was just going to make a general point around tactics and strategies, whatever they are, by employing them, you're trying to gain an advantage. And I guess the, t the two the two sort of roots of that are to utilise your individual and collective strengths, or two two, but also to disrupt the opponent. So, like um, Mike said there about numbers, superiority or advantage, if you want gaining some advantage, numbers can do that. Um, so that's why, and, and almost that's the reason. And it might, might sound obvious, but it's worth really considering for coaches out there around where where do you have your numbers and why in what moment. So that's really what we're talking about in essence um, through the different tactics and strategies that Scoobs is going to be talking about. Yeah, and game state comes into it, doesn't it? And development of a player, what you, or development of your team, you know, all those things where, you know, these things don't happen overnight. So you have to have a really good periodization of the season or two seasons. You know, we moved from a mid-block team into a higher pressing team but, but we knew we had to get better at higher pressing and we still have to get better at higher pressing. So, you know, this thing, these things develop all the time. Um, as yeah, well. and I think on that, Scoobs, you make a great point around, certainly around development, if you're coaching younger ages, around what are the implications well, from whatever strategy or tactics you employ, what are, the, what are the implications collectively, but importantly, on the individual? Yeah. So if you're one of the two, what implications by having a two, does it have for the individual when you're involved in it? What implications does it have for the player in the second line or the third or fourth? So just understand we're doing this, and these are the implications or the consequences on these players. And this is what the, these are. This, these are the situations this player is going to have more likely to deal with because of the way we've set up. And I think that's a really important considera consideration, especially younger down. Yeah, yeah. Building on that, then, what might the attributes be of some of these players? If you look at that picture there what attributes might each of these players need if you're in a performance environment or be working on if you're in an development yeah. environment? Um, well, if you notice from the picture, what we always say is well, it's, it probably gets a little bit more complex. You never be, you, you want to be on the defensive line as the first two, but never on the same line. So you're just off by a metre. So, we, you know, so you've got different covering lines. So that's where it gets. So that's why we've got that player just off a little bit. But, you know, we want the... The back player to be, you know, physical because they're probably matched up with a pivot. We want a, a middle player to be good covering and balancing, understands the game, can watch the game, can make good decisions. And then the front two players for me are, the, you know, aggressive, fast, quick, agility, you know, speed out of the blocks. Um, but also they have to be really good in 1v1 defending skills um, and recovery skills because they're the ones that are going to try and steal the ball, if you like, and put that pressure on. So you need all those facets. But, you know... Uh, you might you you've also got to be physically fit to do this because you you know you're playing over a longer distances and when when the ball does get zipped over the top you've got to recover to wherever your strategy line is to recover to but so physically you have to be more fitter to to press um you probably be, can make more mistakes on the first line but you can't make so many on the the other lines um but you but the, the advantage is when you make those mistakes they're further away from goal um compared to you know if we play in a in a diamond or a one two one if you make a mistake there, you're pretty much you're pretty much dead. Okay. If we uh, try and bring this to life with some footage, Let's see what it looks like. I think we've got some training examples here, which is a really good insight. And okay. thanks for sharing these with us to look at what training a high press might look like. So we're looking at the blues here in defence. Yeah. So we we're, we're just practicing here. You know, quite a simple practice, really. We, um, where we're setting up a 2 one, one so we've got the covering player covering the middle, watching to see what happens. You know, if I was to uh, converse it, we always talk about playing out. We want to um, overload the first line, but affect the second line of defence. So that's what types of movements we talk about in possession. So out of possession, the middle man's job in, in a 2 one, one is really important mm. to watch what's going on, to have that cover and balance and then select the decision. And then what you'll see in there again is that that first player out is actually dictating which side the ball goes. So then we can create what we call a 2v2. So if you notice as that little block comes in, he tweaks over, shows it, that's one pass. If you show the second pass now, if you pause it there, we're in a 2v2 situation. So we've gone from being underloaded to a matched up situation where we can be more aggressive. Well, I, I, with that, Scoops, the individual actions around um, pressing in a way that you cut the line in the pass and all these things we have talked about are vital for any strategy or tactic to work in the moment, aren't they? Yeah. 
and vital as a pair that they understand and recognise triggers off each other defensively rather than just doing their own job. So as that block's come in there, and I think it's Calvin started to tweak there to show it one way, that second player needs to be ready to go and get tight. But even when he detaches and exchanges and gets to the ball, then um, he's doing it in a way that cuts cuts off their third man. So it's really yeah. intelligent, that sort of secondary press. So he's gone to the ball, but as he try, now he sort of cuts that line off across the court. So it's a, them little individual actions are, are vital. Just yeah. uh, interesting out in terms of practice design. So this is obviously you on camp, and this seems to be just like, like a game. You tend to do a lot of game based practice watch yeah so that. yeah generally we try and as much as possible you know match it up be game based directional goals um sometimes we'll make it shorter probably you'll see i don't know what parks he's got ready from the training footage but you know you'll see it shortened for different reasons but we pretty much you know lots of ball rolling work on individual aspects and paired aspects um but you're right yeah directional matched up play as much as possible really um probably stop it a little bit sometimes depending on the, the the little details that we want to get out and it also be preparing you've got to remember we're preparing for an opposition as well so we have our our way of playing but we might be talking i might be talking about you know probably get onto italy clips where they have a really good individual that we need to nullify so at performance level we're starting to talk about the real sort of opposition traits as well a little bit good if we see the next clip I think it's the same practice. I think the other thing there is, you know, when we're saying that first player's cutting off one side, you mentioned strategy. It might be that you've recognised that they've got a weaker player on one side. So, it, Or is it just the player's decision as to which side they show them? Or is it based on the opposition? Yeah, so that's part of setting the trap. You know, you need different different traps, but then you need to understand different triggers of what trap you're setting. So, you know, this might be a practice where we are pre pressing 2 one one line one and I think it was Russell there. You saw him really aggressively pressing the strong foot. So he's gone to, if you pause it there, he's gone to press the strong foot of the left footer. So the left footer can't play on the side he wants to. And actually gives you that little bit of advantage to go two versus two. So again there, if you notice, as soon as he's done that, that's a 2v2 situation. The mum meet there, the middle player probably can get a bit more aggressive. But you'll notice again, you know, he's attacking attacking the better leg we call it so they have yeah. to play negative right so that's why he's done it he's showed this way because of the footed i wonder if maybe it was a like i said you were trying to play it to the side of their weaker play or something but it could be for either of those reasons i suppose yeah i think there's not many weak players at international level in that sense yeah, good point <laughs> so you, you you have to you know you have to have your own i think i'm a believer you have your own way of doing it and then oh, that's you a really just, good point just tweak it because otherwise you'll end up just worrying about every other player on court and actually we have to worry about ourselves more. Yeah, great point. And yep. then you'll notice here, sorry, yep. Carol, you notice here they change. There's an exchange on the first line to stay high. And then a really good, like if you notice, we haven't talked about that second player yet, being, under, being a controller of cover and balance. So if you watch the second player here, starts to cover in case the line gets beaten, and then he's out here. Do you see it? Yeah, I was going to that player actually. Let's go out, Scoop. So I guess two main jobs is to really provide cover and balance and a little bit of depth behind the first line, but also cut out passing lines to the pivot. Is that are they the two sort of fundamental jobs or any, anything else? Perfect. That's it. That's it. So first, that player's in there to stop the long one into the pivot um, and you know double up if you like. And then after the ball's gone short, is then to work out which runner they take coming through or to cover the cover the press really. And if you notice there, he does it really well. He comes across, makes it. And if you go back to the principles, half in the court, watch how he halves the court all the time. So here he's half in the court. Harder to play out. And then recognises the danger in, in in the other player coming through. But also the, the compactness in terms of his distance between, and, and staying connected to the sort of pressing front two, really. Yeah. And able to jump, you know, able yeah. to jump off then. That's really good. I was just looking at the back player. I know we talked about marking in front in previous webinars. The green player there marking in front of the blue player, which again helps Perfect. to stop them playing straight into them because that could be bypassed effectively, couldn't it? The keeper or the back player could play straight if they don't mark in front. 
Yeah, I think that's really important because what that back player is doing is closing the passing lines into the front player. And actually, a lot of players think marking behind is more effective. But as the ball comes across here, if that green was behind, it'd be an easy pass into the front player. So it actually puts, puts pressure on the ball carrier by marking in front. And then you'll notice the keeper's position is quite high. So if the ball does come in there, you might even see a futsal keeper come and head it and duel. So we actually get a two versus one on their attacker, including the keeper. Okay. This probably may be strategy again. Do you have a preference of where whether you want them to play down the line or play back? So I know some people would hear when it goes to the blue play on the side, they would actually want or encourage that pass. They'd want the blues to play down the side so that they could force it off down there. Is that something you talk about or would you rather it come back and be in front of them? For me, I'd come back and be in front and keep the press on and keep it on as long as possible. But I know, like you say, different coaches at different levels have different styles and strategies. For me, personally, I'd keep them going negative. I call it a negative pass. So yeah. two negative passes, we start to win, is what I say. So that's a negative pass where we can start to really go and hunt that ball back down. Brilliant. Next clip, I think we've got some... Th- match day footage now of some high presser in a game it never quite looked like it looks in training does it match day footage <laughs> yeah, yeah. there's um, probably a message similar. in there somewhere though isn't there yeah but no but similar you know if you look at the i'd say here the, probably the we in the game we're getting too deep so if you talk about our defensive lines you know we're not quite pressing enough try to press the pass again but a bit deep coming out Great, great individual um, closing the middle there. Um, so them two. But then here, if you notice, if you if you pause that, we drop too deep. Um, so actually, we've dropped far too deep to get the press on. So when it does come, and in futsal, you're talking, you know, I always say to futsal players, going one metre is like going five metres in football in terms of the distances. You know, so when they dropped off one or two metres there, we've pretty much like dropping off 10 metres in football. So to me, they are, you know, I'm they're three metres, two metres too deep in that second phase. So the first phase, we've got a good press on here. And then the organisation, we've closed the middle quite well, but then we've gone too deep off the back of that. And is it intentional that this player... Oh, it's just gone through now. I'll run it through. But when it resets in that second phase, it's not a 2-1-1 so much. It's more the kind of the one who would be in the middle is out wider. Is that intentional or is that not intentional? No, so... I think what, no that's, that's where players have to be, you know, in, for me, football-wise, you rotate in, in, in possession, you rotate out of possession. So... What so happened here, here was that player yeah. in the in training was probably more central. Yeah. So, but it's not static, is it? So we have to remember the game's not static. The game is fluid. So as the ball's gone back and that player's gone through, you know he's probably body shape needs to be better. Um, I don't know where that clip's gone. Sorry, it's if we go back to it. So there was an exchange on the the first line. So that changed. So if you pause there, so in that press. The, the middle player was on the first line, but now becomes the cover and balance. And his shape's not quite right. He should be watching the player. And actually, he's gone with the player, turned his back on the game. So by the time he's sort of sorted himself out individually, there, he's trying to sort himself out now. Um, he's probably followed him a little bit too much. So that's about individual body shape. So when he, when he came off the first line, became the second line, he needed to sort his own shape out quicker um, before the game got going again. I think what's interesting, Parksy, though, is you can't determine what the opponent will do. So if they have, in the last clip, there was more like three in the first line, that's a numerical advantage there. In this one, they haven't. So it obviously affects the second player then, um, generally. And that would be the same in football as well. So you do have to adapt. So you might have your, your real ideals, but then that is the game, isn't it, around adapting and, and balancing. And that's where balance and covering these things become really important. Yeah. Brilliant. And they've organised quite well. It's just that little bit. They lose a split second here when he's turned to look at where the ball is and get a reference of the game. That 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 marker, if you like, his opposite players managed to get out and wide and suddenly they've got a pass a pass out, if you like. But, but again, at the back, that deep player still marking in front, side on, can see both. Yeah. Allows it to run through to the goalkeeper, like you said, who is, has to be very alert in these situations. Yeah. Okay, if we go back to the slides... And look at um, more of a mid block. So that was yeah. high press. Why might you use a mid block, and ha- what the similarities and differences may be between the high press? Yeah, so probably just a little bit more compact. 
so that we were going from being a bit more open and being aggressive to being a bit more compact. Um, I, I call it a mid blocks there to sort of pick up triggers and build more pressure. So, you know, strategy wise, we might start as a mid block and then build into a two one one. So again, it's a bit more fluid. Some teams will start as a two one one and work backwards. Sometimes we'll work in a mid block and build into it, depending on what triggers we can pick up in, in negative play in there in the opposition. Um, we control condense the space that they can play in a little bit more. Um, it's probably a little bit easier to exchange because the distances aren't as far. So when we're exchanging defensively now, the distances aren't as far to run. So you'll find that that player in the second line then, because we're a bit higher, was turning its back and following players. That probably doesn't happen so much. So it's it's easier not to lose players, opposition players. Um, so it's a li little difference, you know, closing the middle becomes a little bit easier because, we, again, we're more compact when the ball's on the side. So there's different, you know, trade-offs, I call it. But okay. ultimately, you're giving up space, aren't you? You're giving up territory straight away. I suppose there, there's more space to counter into is another yep, thing to you consider. Could look, yeah. And like you said earlier, depending on the attributes of your players, either from a performance perspective or from a development perspective, mm -hmm. it's worth considering. Yeah. Um, do you want to get to the video and we can continue yeah. to discuss through that? I think we've got some more training, slightly different practice, so... Again, interested to hear your thoughts on what's going on from a practice design point of view. Okay, yeah, if I remember, we were practicing a three in line in possession and how we would defend against that. So we were talking about um, within our mid block. If we, I think it was we were going out to play France actually for a call. So if you notice, the yellows are sort of actually setting up as a, a three in line structure, and I think we talked about that in another um, before that. And then how do we build? build into triggers so what you'll notice here is that more passes is allowed but then suddenly when there's a trigger or a negative pass or we're, we're tight or the games become tighter we then would follow through here so you know when you talked about is it a zone or is it man for man we're actually we're, we're we're man for man following through here unless we can exchange on the sides um, on the weak side of the court so if you notice here the yellow step of three in line that gives us a trigger if the ball goes wide as a two-two. So if I it? just, oh yeah, I just take that back and pause it for people. If it's just uh, uh, that's sorry. it. Uh, so the yellows we're talking in possession. Yellows in are trying to set up three up a line. One at the back, yeah. one on the left, and then one higher on the left. That's their that's three it. in line. They're trying to set yeah. up. And you're yeah. talking about how is the greens you defend against that? Yeah. What what triggers are we trying to work towards to get into to start as a mid block and then get into the pressure? If you see it. So we've started as a mid block. The trigger came when they set up a three in line. The ball went wide on their weak on their sort of one player. That allowed us to get out quick and be aggressive on certain moments of the game, and then followed through. Just a, another, just another follow up question on the on back to the zonal man to man balance and everything in between. Really, around um, what are the trade offs? Do you find um, benefits? Do you know what I mean of my, and and how yeah, do you good question. Sort of like how do you decide? We're man to man, or we're man to man in this situation, or we're man to man in the first. How what how what informs your decision on that? Yeah, so that's just a great question. So for me, the, the, there's a few trade-offs. One is if you're um, man to man, then it's very much an individual game all over the pitch, all over the court. So if you get beat, um, if you get beat as an individual, you can be more exposed than if you're a zonal. So the thing about zonal is you're, you're protecting space all the time, so that if an individual gets beat there's someone else to come into that zone so the obvious um the other thing with it is sometimes that um you can be beat man for man by pace so pace into pockets whereas it's harder with zonal because you can actually keep the game in front of you with a zone um and that's where exchange is sort of a, the best of both worlds um but the problem with exchanging is sometimes that if you get it wrong then someone's free so, you know, I like to exchange on certain areas of the court, certain areas of the pitch, because it's less dangerous. Yeah. Um, but, there's, yeah, there's lots of different trade-offs. Um, yeah, I, I think, think another one as well is around the attacking transition. If, if you're man for man, you can end up anywhere, can't you? Where if you're zonal, then you have a little bit more, tend to have a bit more organisation in terms yeah. of your offensive transition. But I know um, that can be a trade-off. And as you said, there can be a lot just always interesting why why people do certain things yeah and also how you know you might have a um an opposition who cut through deeper so for example don't like to play in the middle like to play through diagonals 
so you, you could exchange better in that whereas if they're if they're playing in the pockets you probably can't exchange because they're going to stop in between the lines so it also gets into the strategy around them as an opposition do they like to play in between the lines do they like to play into corners do they like to play higher so actually within that you've also got your defensive strategy about what's best against um so we know we went out to play china and we played czech republic who are brilliant with the ball um we sat off in a mid block and exchanged because they had a really good strong pivot um but we, but it, when they ran through we could pick them up do you see me so we might have an extra second if they're playing not so much through the middle than a team that would pop it round you where you know you're in trouble really and just on so even design, why, yeah. why, why the pitch why you move the pitch in what what you hoping what do you what would you get from that do you want to turn for the length so you've taken some depth yeah. out and they're just out of interest yeah. just what well one is sometimes just to shorten it just literally physically to shorten it a bit um it, i don't know what stage of training we're in so but also just to get lots of repetition and and repetition in the practice from the goalkeepers are set up and um, basically to me to force the repetition of where the three in line happens so if we'd have gone a bit deeper what 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 you find is the teams will set through because because we were practicing against the three in line i wanted it to be where it would be relevant most against france where they set it up so it sort of forces the game to to recreate what we were trying to play against in in what we we're going to face later down the line oh, that's really good really good so the final one we're going to look at is the low block um, haven't got training footage of this. Is that maybe because you tend not to train it as often, or um, is I there think a reason? Yeah, I would say with probably our um, senior pro, senior pros or the senior team that they, they, they probably have all done this in their career and started with this. You find in England a lot of teams, you know, even myself, you'd start in a low block and then build from that because it's probably easier to coach. So if you look on our courses, it's it's like a diamond, I think we call it, or a two-two. So, you know, it's no surprise to me when I watch, you know, um, youth futsal, whether it's with the leagues or the Premier Leagues, a lot of teams are playing a low block and countering because, you know, those situations. But it's it's probably more complicated to, to manage a high press and manage a mid block than it is to a low block. Um, so we generally, are, you know, I'm com we haven't got much footage to answer your question simply is because I think they can do it okay for the level that they're at. Obviously, there's nuances within that, but... Um, the trade-off is obviously you give up loads of space, you give up loads of um, gaps, but ultimately this is about being really compact, really good cover and balance. More zonal for me, you know, when I go into a low block against a fly or a good opposition, I'm very much a zonal low block because if you follow a player or, or well, if you follow a player, you can open up big spaces in the middle of the court. Um, if you exchange and get it wrong here, pff, goal. So for me, this is more personally a, a zonal method of you know defending it's interesting yeah should we um have a look at the clip we have got a game we're in the game i suppose the other thing as well scoobs it's the fact the time so we talked about those pyramids a lot actually in the international scene you haven't got as long with the players so you've got to prioritize what you work on haven't you yeah um yeah and so we you know we would probably set up our defensive line here we'd say 10 to 12 meters of the first player the first player we always talk about being connected with the back player and then the wingers work as pendulums out. So as one winger goes out to get pressure on the ball, you'll notice the other winger here is coming in and covering. So, you know, we talk about the pair work. The pair work here is actually the top player working with the winger and the top player working with the other winger, the back player working with the top player in terms of condensing lines. So, you notice 14s condensing the pitch. Um, and then you're also talking about the one winger, the eight and the 10 covering and balancing each other off, off the ball. So we're really, we, we are being really compact. And the reason we're really compact against Italy is because, you know, they're stronger than us. If we'd have go toe for toe, I think technically they would have, they like to play 4-0 and pop round us. So we just wanted to make it really difficult. And they also had, you know, Merlin was a world-class individual player. And if you give individual players um, in a mid-block some space, they can really open you up 1v1. So I think go back to Cara's point earlier, this is probably where we'd use a low block where we don't want to go man for man against the opposition. Do you ever double up on like on a, on a real special player? I know I'm guessing numbers wise, that might be hard. Just like you said, out of naivety, I'm asking that really. Is it? Is it? Yeah, I suppose. I suppose from a, this is really doubling up from a football perspective. If you know what I mean, this is the way, you know. Yeah. If you notice the bit where the cover and balance is. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. 
do you, do you understand what I mean? So our number nine there is pretty much doubling up in the 14. So this zonal, if you like, the deep block is pretty much doubling up on every player in a weird kind of way. Um, yeah. The only other thing we do doubling, we call, is when the ball goes down the line and someone jumps from line one to line two to come and try and steal yeah. it. Uh, yeah. A bit of a different concept, but yeah. You're right. Yeah, as, you say, as you say, the, the depth and the compactness gives you that natural cover, doesn't it? Because the distances are so close between people and the way that you half the court and all these things give you the cover naturally. But it's just, yeah, I just wonder if you really... So I think you have general... Um, in football and futsal, you have general principles that, that govern the game, which have <laughs> never changed. Yeah. But then you come, once in a while, you come up against these special players that you need to adapt. You need to... You know, yeah. you, the norm doesn't cater for what you need to do with that player that you're up against. So I just wondered how you adapted that. Was That really was. Yeah, we would... Um, yeah, yeah, it would be cover. We'd call it extra cover. So, yeah. for example, some of the these players merlin was great with his you know left foot but so we would we would be really over covering a certain area um so in the zone if we were if you pause it here um Foxy, i don't know if you Sorry. can pause it here as the player goes out to the ball and puts pressure on we would say the nine don't even think about the ball going negative because if you can duck inside here um, yeah yeah so so if you notice here this is our extra cover yeah. the, the nine could have been more aggressive waiting for a negative and the 10 could have been more aggressive waiting for the winger, but we're, we're worried about these individuals here ducking inside um, and scoring. Because we're deep, what we don't want to do is give up central of, central areas of the court for a shot because if you shoot from... At, that, at their level, if you shoot from 10 metres, they're probably going to score. Yeah, I think the key is that the 10, the right winger for the England, the 10, is so far across that you talked about the halfway line that the 14 then doesn't have to worry about cutting off that passing line. The 10's doing his job. So the 14 can then yeah. cover the eight a bit more. Whereas yeah. if you were further up, you know, like the yeah. 10 would probably be out a bit. So the 14 would have to cover that passing line from the diagonal in case he came inside yeah. and hit a diagonal. But because you're deeper, yeah. like you've said, the 14 can then cover the eight down the line. Yeah, a really good, um, a really good reference for, for coaches for me, and this is wherever the ball is, you're in a diamond. So wherever the ball is faced. So if you notice roughly here, if the 10 was out here, we wouldn't be in a diamond it'd be too flat. So we've actually got nearly three lines of defence, if you like. So you've got the eight, the nine would be, we've gone really sort of deep on it, but the nine's like the first line, the eight's the second line. Um, and then the ten's sort of coming in and covering. So if you notice here, it's like a diamond shape. So the 14's ready to go on the cover, but the 10 is, and this is really key, Parksy, because if the 10 wasn't there, the keeper's got to come across and all of a sudden this back post is absolutely free. So if that clever players managed to just do a little Beersley shuffle and pull it to the back stick. <laughs> you know, they're going to be able to, they're going to tap it in free. So actually the 10 is doing such an important job here just by positional defensively. So if we go back to it again, and if, I don't know if the ball shifts. I uh, know it's just, it's, it's maybe an obvious point, but the trade off to that then is it's harder to get pressure on the ball, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Typically. And that's the problem. Yeah. Especially if they switch. And you have it, to have so... really disciplined players. Yeah. That nine at the top, you know, you talked about making sure he doesn't duck inside. But if he comes so deep, then they just square it across the other side. And the guy's got loads of space, like you said, to have a touch inside. Yeah. So here, when it goes out, if red nine comes so deep to cover, they just That's... play straight across yeah. that line to the other side. And ten's got a long way to get out. So nine's got a job and a half a little bit there. Yeah, and I think, yeah. And, you know, you, you, you're trading off, you, you're right, you're trading off depth, aren't you? Um, but ultimately, that's where you have to close the middle. So if the ball stays here, there's our diamond. Nine's on the first line, eight and ten on the second line, and 14 battling with the pivot. Um, but we're really deep. But what the nine can't do, allow is central shots. Yeah, good. And that brings us to a summary, really. Um, Try to cover the different ways of defenders we've talked, we talked a bit tactically. We've got into strategy, which is probably that top end of the pyramid, which has been interesting to talk about. We've touched on some of the individuals and small group stuff, or we've tried to. Links to football, we haven't covered too much. Um, maybe the last couple of minutes, we could just talk generically about where the, the generic transferables might be from a tactical point of view, you know, playing a, a deep block or a low block in futsal. What do you think the similarities or transfers for playing a low block in football are Cara. I'd say that um the general principles 
um, are transferable across the whole thing. So the, the general principles around, um, I think, football principles around pressure, um, compactness, cover balance. These these things are, are vital. Um, and the trade understanding the trade offs of I might trade off some pressure to get more cover, or by applying more pressure while the individual collectively we might lose some compactness. These are the decisions. So again, I think the, the big thing where it does fit is. Um, yeah, the principles are definitely transferable in, in the, the ideas. And this, the, when you're thinking about tactics and strategies, the implications, why you're doing it, what you're getting, where you're trying to gain advantage, whether it's numbers or space, and then the implications on the players. So what does this mean for this player? What does this mean for the back player? If we're playing 2-1, one we're defending 2-1-1, one, one, what does that mean for the back player and the, and the goalkeeper, uh, as well as everyone? And just understand physically, but technically, um, and even the way they feel in the game, what is the implication, especially if you're working with younger players? Um, and just having a grasp of that so you know what you're asking of the players and what the benefits of development opportunities might be for the for the players. But yeah, in terms of the individual actions and the the, the first first player towards the ball, the second player, cover, balance, um, pressure, all these things are, that to me are directly transferable. The only thing might be obviously the numbers on the pitch and sometimes the distances they might cover might be a bit different, but the principles and the pin in it absolutely transferable in my eyes. Yeah, I'll just probably add to that, Parksy. I think it, yeah, the okay. principles are the, the, the transferable things for me massively. I think one thing that you know that, that I think Futsal does give young footballers is feedback about when they've got it right and wrong. So, for example, you know, if we were to press international level high press and we get done on the first line we're 4v3 and it can be a goal within four seconds. Now, it's really easy to then look at the defenders and look at the other lines of defence and go, oh, they've not done their job. But actually, the, the pressure player in line one, if you like, that went after that ball, didn't quite get his shape right, is the problem that we need to fix. And I think sometimes with 11 players, a number nine can go and press something half-heartedly, not quite do it, and there's so much sort of insurance policies behind them that it never gets pulled up. So I think for coaches... It really helps as well for feedback around the individual detail that build, builds into it because I just think the game gives you feedback. Goals gives you goals if you get something wrong, really. So oh, that's really good. Thanks, guys. Uh, a little bit emotional was the last one in the series, but um, thanks ever so much for all your your time and effort and and knowledge throughout these um, webinars. And uh, we're sure we'll keep in touch. Thanks a lot. Thank See you. Guys.